We made it. Thank you so much. <laughs> to be patient. Um, so here uh, today it's uh, me. Uh, it's Ilenia. I'm a senior agile practitioner for the uh, Core Agile System Engineering. I've been working at Red Hat for three years, well, more than three years, and uh, I worked within OpenShift and now I'm working within Rel. Um, that's why today with me I have Irene. She is one of the engineers in the Rel Edge team that I work with. Uh, yeah, good afternoon and nice to meet you all. I'm Irene Diez. I'm a software engineer in the Rel Forest team and we are responsible for Rel Forest as well as uh, Fedor IoT. Uh, nice to meet you. So in this talk, we are going to try to explain how we, how we manage to create a successful environment so that the team can get better, uh, how our specific trans team transformation went, and at the end we'll finish with a couple of uh, key points that you should take away from this talk. All right, I think we all know that change is art, right? Uh, and to make an environment to be successful, we really need to try to pace the, um, to handle the pace of change. People deal with change in different ways, and we need to take that into consideration. People go through different phases, and I want to show you here an example. I will be using uh, the tabular cross model and explaining this with a real life example. I think each of us here probably had the experience this situation. Uh, we basically had a key team member leaving the team a uh, while back. Uh, he was a high performing individual um, and we had, it was a great loss for us basically. Um, so I want to show you this uh, with this example. The first thing that happened for us was that we were, we were all in shock. So we were all surprised about what was happening. And uh, the second phase is the denial phase. So it, here is when we are actually trying to look for ev evidence that that didn't happen. Um, so uh, I remember personally talking to someone in the team and saying, no, I cannot believe this is happening. It's really true. Uh, then people usually move to the frustration phase. Um, and this is even the uh, phase where people are angry. So they usually uh, try to blame uh, themselves or they try to, to, blame, to blame someone else. Um, then the next phase is the one of the depression where there is a low mood, low energy, lack in uh, um, productivity. And from this point on, we try to go, we move on to actually more positive um, uh, phases. So we start with the experiment. Uh, here it's where people tr try, start to deal uh, with this new um, situation and they start to be more positive about that. And then we go through the decision phase. Uh, here people, they, they start really accept accepting um, that things changed and they feel more comfortable and uh, positive uh, about the old situation. And the last phase is the phase of integration. Here is basically the change is now uh, a status quo and you know people go back you know to the normal life basically. Um, so people, so I was saying that um, we really need to handle the pace of change because as I said, people go through those phases and some of them they just go through few of those phases. Other people maybe go through all of them one by one, and people move uh, backwards and forwards between those phases. So people really need time to actually deal with the change that is going on. So I wanted to share with you what I believe is the foundation of a culture that uh, um, is needed to create a successful environment for a team transformation. Uh, the first thing is creating condition where the team can actually start new behaviors and they do that through new habits. When we talk about new habits, new habits are basically reinforced patterns and they need to be consistent. Consistent in bad days and good days. So really consistency here is the key to enforce new habits so they can change behavior. 
Uh, second is creating a goal, a goal that is inspiring and scary at the same time, and that it goes behind comfort zone for people. Um, a goal that is going to sparkle imagination, that is, is going to engage heart and mind uh, for people. Um, so it's going to be, it's going to be, it's going to bring all together so that you can actually go through um, the, the silos, break the silos that you have within the team or even within an organization. Uh, third, uh, fourth thing is to actually start practicing transparency and open communication. So basically, um, people really need to understand the why behind the decision, or at least they need to understand how the, deci the decision was made. Um, people, um, I think we can all say that we use at least to say that um, that the um, um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Uh, we used to say that, that you know the change uh, is um, uh, needs to be uh, it's difficult for people and then that's why we need open communication within the team. Uh, the next thing is about creating an idea of meritocracy. Uh, so great ideas comes to people. Uh, attention to the leaders' attention on different ways. It can be because they come directly from the leader, uh, from the leaders, or because um, those idea comes from the people within the team or an organization. Um, so they can come from different levels. But to do that, you really need to make an environment um, and a culture where people are not afraid to speak up, uh, to share feedback, <laughs> and uh, you know to to be open. Um, there is always someone that is going to merge within a team, uh, so you need to try to create as well an environment where people, uh, where a leader can emerge in that, so that's really important as well. Last but not least, I think I didn't mention this word yet, so maybe you were expecting it, it's agile principles and values. <laughs> and so the agile has a lot to offer in, in terms of transformation. Um, if we think about limiting the work in progress, or if we think about creating uh, self-organizing teams, um, so or if we think about prioritize the work so that people can actually focus, in, focus on delivering value for their customers or stakeholders, and you know we have as well the values that are really relevant, like commitment, uh, courage, openness, respect, um, and so on, right? Okay, so I think I'm gonna hand over now uh, to Irene to talk about the team. Yeah, so our team. Uh, our team is uh, six people, uh, which are the developers. We come from different uh, experience levels and backgrounds. There are people who have been in Red Hat for more than 10 years and so on. Others like me are more, more new to the team and so on. Our team is fully remote. That is something that causes uh, some issues because we are not used to dealing with people, we don't know each other and sometimes there is some kind of context that is lost. You cannot just simply go to someone's desk and strike a conversation with them in order to, I don't know, uh, find a common ground in an issue or something like that. So that is something that is lost being fully remote. So you have to make the most of the meetings that you have scheduled and so on in order to be productive and so on. Uh, another thing is that uh, the team had a different um, familiarity with Agile. There are people uh, who have been uh, working for Agile, others like me, uh, we studied it at university, but this is our first job with the framework, so we had to learn it again. And of course, the, the team is still growing because we are uh, building products in an emerging market, so the team is still growing as we uh, try to identify which are the areas that need uh, most of the focus. Uh, regarding to our Scrum team, we have all the roles that you would expect. We have our fantastic Scrum Master, which is Eleni over here, the product owner, and the rest of the team are the developers. And, yeah. So let me 
talk to you based on the TACMAS stages of team development, what happened with our team. So TACMAS says that there are like four different stages, the forming, storming, norming, and performing stages. And there are uh, a couple of behaviors that are more common in those stages. For instance, in the forming stage, everybody in the team is feeling very, very excited because, I mean, there are new things that we want to work for, I mean, to, we want to work on, but uh, that, that is excitement is common, but also there might be some anxiety going on because uh, we don't know what the future might hold. And overall, we can say that there is a low task accomplishment because we are getting used to the processes, the team, and everything. Then we would get to the storming phase where we start to understand the goals or velocity. Um, yeah, we some disagreements might arise because of the processes and because we are trying to understand velocity and some agile concepts and so on. Um, yeah, then we get to the oh, one thing. In the storming phase, we also have to take into account that people have different personalities, so we need to try to identify which personalities work best with uh, each other. So that is something that we also need to take into account. Finally, we reach the norming stage where we can see that the goals of the team are better understood and we know uh, what are the things and the processes that we need to do in order to, to deliver. So overall, we can say that there is an emphasis on team goals and we try to help each other because the goal is to perform as a team. And then the final stage is the performance stage where each member in the team understands what are the strengths and weaknesses or of each uh, team member and then we can plan and we can try to make the most of our team. So uh, this team formed in 2021 and since then, uh, I mean, this process that you see here is not linear. So in our, in our case, uh, we had new team members, some team members that left and so on. So on one stage, we were in the performing stage, but due to these changes, I would say that right now we are between the norming and the performing stages. Yeah. Okay, so now I want to share with you the challenges uh, that we faced during our team transformation. Um, so I remember being in some of the meetings that the team was having and they were discussing uh, about can we actually move this user story to done. So that's where, is, is this happening with anyone in here? Raise your hand. Cool, perfect, yes, that's normal. <laughs> um, so I actually helped them and guided them through the uh, facilitating the discussion about the definition of done. Uh, so that they were all aligned on what done means for the team. Then we had some other meetings when they were actually trying to estimate user stories and something else that happened was I was hearing them saying should we go for a three or a five? Let's go for a five because it's safer. Is this happening to anyone here? Okay, cool. Um, and another thing was, uh, so, sorry, uh, so I actually uh, did some training with them about using story points and, uh, you know, help them to understand how to estimate. So we aligned them as well um, on this topic. Uh, this is not happening any anymore, right? Well. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we need to do another session then. Uh, <laughs> then we have... <laughs> We had, we, they had a lot of things to work uh, with and it was a problem that like they had too many things to handle. So we really needed to understand which one were the priorities. Um, so I helped the, the managers, the, yeah, the managers, the leaders and so on to talk about the priorities and then uh, we actually talked to the team about this. Um, and then we have the capacity planning. Uh, that's another challenge, but I'm gonna tell you more in a second about this. So I'm gonna show you now a uh, velocity chart. Uh, so here we, uh, we are at sprint 31, 31 to start with. Um, basically, they are already having a change here because this was a team that was 
basically a bigger team, so it was, it was, they were two teams together. Uh, at that point, they were one. But um, a sprint 31 was the sprint where, uh, the last sprint before they actually went, um, they split it. So uh, the teams were going in different directions, so we decided to, they decided actually to split between them. And so that's why we see those high bars in here because it was even way more people um, working together. Uh, so if we look at Sprint 32, that's where they start working together as a team. Uh, here we were just before Christmas holidays. Uh, people were like, yeah, but don't worry, we can do everything, right? Uh, we're gonna be able to do a lot of things. Um, and so we see that they actually committed to 32 story points and they were able to deliver only eight. But it's, you know, it was Christmas, so it's all right. Um, so we, we go back in January and, uh, you know, we still had people doing the onboarding as well because we had new people joining. Uh, but still the team was like, yeah, we are all back from holidays now, we are all here, we can do a lot of things together, so they actually committed to do even more, 48, and they delivered only eight points again. All right. Um, so at uh, Spring 34, it's when the team started to feel a bit more confident, the onboarding was going better for everyone, and uh, yeah, they were like, yeah, we are a team now, cool. We can still do a lot of things, right? So they committed to 43 and they deliver 10, a bit better. Um, okay, so here we start seeing some challenges. Uh, first, it's about the capacity. We couldn't really understand the capacity of uh, the team at this point because they were carrying over stories sprint by sprint. Is it happening to anyone? Yes, yeah, a lot of hands up, okay. Um, so we did try uh, a thing. So we decided to actually go back to our definition of done and review it and it was specifically a point that was saying, um, we are gonna move, uh, a user story is gonna be moved to done when uh, the PR is gonna be approved and merged, right? Uh, cool, yeah, that's what we were doing until now. But we had to review that because of this carrying over the stories, sprint by sprint. So we changed that to, um, we are gonna split our, uh, st our story into two different, um, a story and a task, basically. The story was the implementation work for the team and they were like, yeah, I did my part, right? It's all done from my side. But then they needed to wait for approval from upstream or for, from external teams and so on. So they were like, yeah, I've done my part, I can move it to done. Um, so we did this. We uh, split this, the two cards. We had the implementation one, and they could move that to done with the story points they estimated at the beginning, and we opened uh, a new task, basically. There was a tracker just for the PR. With zero story points, we were having hit there just to remind ourselves that there is still going on. So let's see what happened. Uh, things are going better now, right? 43 committed, 30 delivered. So that's a big change, I would say, now for them. Um, happy times, uh, but still, there is still a problem here that actually we are over committing. How many of you come on? I expect a lot of hands here of about over committing all the time. Okay, okay, good. <laughs> so we said, you know what? Let's try something else. Let's try to actually uh, take a step back and uh, uh, commit to only one card each. Uh, so we tried this and Voila, 29 uh, that we committed, so less than usual. Uh, and they were actually to finish everything plus that they committed plus something else. So they delivered 34 at this point. So, um, you know, we tried different things and so on. So we experimented and we saw that this was helping the situation. Some of those things were helping, others that we tried, maybe they were not helping. So we actually adapted and changed and tried new things. 
Okay, so from my point of view, uh, while there was this transformation going on, uh, I was actually transitioning uh, from a Scrum Master role to an Agile Practitioner role. So I was there at the beginning with the team actually giving them solutions, suggesting things, and I had to move to actually guide them to come uh, to uh, find solutions themselves without actually imposing my ideas. Um, the other uh, important point here for me was that I wanted them to get into a mindset of continuous improvement, so um, they, they were trying experiment all the time, all the time. I mean, every, every four weeks we were trying an experiment, but at least to get them into this mindset of continuous improvement. And last thing is about finding a sustainable pace for the team, right? Uh, because this way we knew what we could commit to and we wouldn't get to burn out. Uh, that's what we don't want from team members. Yeah, and from an engineering point of view, I mean, you have to understand that some emergencies might arise, which are, for instance, back that affect our, cli our clients. So no matter how perfect the planning was, according to your story points and so on, there are times where you must drop everything and take the, the back, which is a task that doesn't have a lot of story points, but you must do it and finish it as soon as possible. The other thing that you have to take into account is that we are an operating system team, so though we don't work in silos, and there are a lot of processes that we don't control. So even though we said from our point of view that the work was finished, there is still the docs, the testing, and other teams that had to give approvals to our task, and that is why uh, splitting the cards worked for us because it also helped us get to that mindset where we were accomplishing something because we saw story points moving to, to them. And finally, yeah, I mean, from uh, our point of view, the story might be finished, but we cannot f uh, ship something that is not tested and that hasn't been thoroughly documented. So we need to, I mean, focusing on one task allowed us to help those other teams in order to get the information that they needed as soon as possible so that everything was uh, finished as soon as possible and, yeah, and that story points could be moved to, to them. So does Agile really help engineers perform better? So personally, I come from an academic background and we work for it with the uh, waterfall development environment. And I find that Agile, of course, is more flexible. And it does not only allow developers to define their processes better, but there are specific like meetings where you can look back and try to think uh, what, is, what is working and what is not working. Because with the waterfall development environment, you have that psychological bad situation where you think that, OK, I I haven't uh, finished this deliverable, deliverable in time, or I'm running out of time to do my testing. So uh, yeah, Agile allows us to identify what is working, what is not, and what we can do about it. So we wanted to share with you some of the lessons uh, learned from us uh, for this transformation. It is still going on. I didn't finish. I mean. Um, so first thing is they construct big change into smaller steps. Um, change fatigue, I really believe, is now a thing. Uh, and we need to try to, as I said at the beginning, people go through the different stages that we saw. So we need to take into consideration that they need uh, the time to adapt to the changes. So don't do changes, just fire changes one by one, right? They need to have the time. Uh, and that's why don't come with like, oh, we're going to change everything from today to tomorrow. No, we need to do that, actually deconstructing a big change in smaller steps. Next thing is about changing the behaviors uh, of uh, the team through their habits. And especially very important, I said this before, is try to get the team driving, actually, the continuous improvement themselves within the team. Um, third thing, thing is to try to build a team uh, with enjoyment of practice. Um, enjoyment should be part of our uh, daily life, but when we talk about our professional life, we usually forget about this, and that's very important. So 
try to uh, schedule some team building activities or even give the space to people to actually talk about their passions together. And the last but not least, focusing on building uh, the right things. So we, we are here to satisfy the needs of our customers or stakeholders. So we don't just have to build things, but we need to actually build the right things. Um, yeah, uh, so we are at the end. What did we learn today uh, here? First, we created an environment that encouraged and enabled the uh, teams to develop and mature, and that's how you build high-performing team. Second, uh, this is our journey. Uh, so we shared our journey that is not unlike other teams, but that's definitely unique to us. So you may or may not be sharing the same challenges. And third, we were successful building uh, the team, an high-performing team, by as Irene said earlier, we are trying to, we were in that stage of high performing and now we try, we went back and now we, because things happened and now we are trying to get back to uh, be um, an high performing team. So yeah, change, change is hard, right? <laughs> okay, so we are going to leave you with this sentence to reflect about the transformation takes a long time and value realization typically takes even longer. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah. Okay. I have many questions. So let's start. Okay. But the first one is very quick. Who is Scrum or uh, or the mix of uh, any other uh, no. Scrum agile? Yeah, no, we uh, started with Scrum and we continue with that. Yeah, yeah, in this case, for this team. And the second one is a little bit uh, more uh, long, probably, to answer, I don't know. But uh, uh, you, you talk about uh, the changing elements of both the uh, changing habits, which is great. I think you do a great uh, job. Yeah. So as I said, uh, um, oh yeah, sorry. So he was basically uh, asking how we deal with change fatigue nowadays, right? Um, so as I said, this is a thing going on, and what you really need to try is not to have too many changes all at once. As I said before, you need to really understand that people need to go through all the phases uh, that I explained at the beginning. So you need to give people the time to go through this process, right? So um, try, there is a change going on, cool, let's try it, we're gonna do that. Um, but give them actually the time and the space to be comfortable with that change. And then you move on to the next steps. So this way you're gonna try, you are gonna avoid the uh, change fatigue because if you're gonna have all the changes, all one one by one, uh, one after the other one, then it's not gonna work. That's when we arrive at the change fatigue phase, right? Yeah. So from an engineering point of view, your team needs to communicate as soon as possible, and if you haven't set up the environment for free communication, then you have failed as an agile practitioner. <laughs> yes. So I'm very glad that what she said because uh, it connects to what I am trying to say. So I work mostly in upstream uh, models. So my team is me, a couple people from Red Hat, a couple people from Google, a couple people from Amazon, whatever. And uh, again, like communication is basically the main tool that we have. Uh, we have we don't have sprints, but we try to have some kind of periodic call uh, to do this. But I cannot like tell people what to do. I cannot uh, organize work across companies because my release uh, 
period is not theirs, uh, and uh, my manager is not theirs, especially. Mm, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, what are some kind of uh, agile concepts that I can learn about and apply in this completely different situation? I think that's collaboration in here. Uh, yeah, yeah, sorry. <laughs> so uh, here you, he was asking about cross-collaboration, basically, between collaborated teams and different teams working together. So I think it will be all about uh, collaboration together and try to communicate. So try to find at least fun times, uh, a few times. For example, with them, we couldn't really find the time that would suit everyone. But we settled in the end of finding two hours in the week on a Tuesday and a Thursday to actually meet all together uh, just for the one hour to start with and try to do all the things and discuss all the things that we needed to. Yeah, so in our case, we have one hour every two weeks, hopefully, with some people doing it at 6 a.m. and some people doing it at 10 p.m. Yeah, yeah. Because it goes from Pacific Coast to China. Yeah, yeah, I see. Yeah, it's a bit. We as well we use Slack, for example, and some of the communication are over there as well for the teams. It's not the same thing, I know, but yeah, uh, try to find some time, at least even 30 minutes, maybe three times uh, per week, to gather all together. Okay. And one of the one of your suggestions of splitting the cards, yeah, I think is something that. Uh, but, but that's one thing that happens with upstream. So I think yeah. doing that with upstream helps you get over that point because they won't fit into your sprint schedule if you try, if you, it just will never work, right? Yeah, so exactly. you, I think it is good to split the cards and let yeah. that happen because otherwise you can't, it's, it's a different schedule. So you have just a meeting. Yeah, even you are lucky. <laughs> you just have a yeah. yeah. So there was one last quick question: uh, How to handle uh, handle after the split uh, when you are lack of senior developers and you get in like a lot of hard topics and you cannot split them into senior developers? Do you have maybe similar issues? And then you have a lot of hard topics, a lot of senior developers, and you cannot be given that because there is no seed to test or something like that because. Developer, yeah. So basically, he's asking how do you, you deal with the fact that senior uh, people, developers, engineers, don't really want to uh, split cards or lose time doing that, right? Um, all this actually came from them. So they saw the challenges from them. They yeah. are here. Uh, <laughs> they actually saw the challenges and they started the discussion and just helped them facilitate the discussions. And they were like, we really need, want to try to actually improve the situation. What we can do about it? Let's talk about that. So it's not something I did impose to them. It's something that came from them themselves. And that's, I think, it's a very important thing because if you go there and saying, okay, we're gonna do this and now you're gonna do it like this, you're not gonna have people happy about doing that, right? But if you give them the time and the space as well to try to understand what are the challenges and let them see as well what are the challenges, then it's gonna be different and they can start having those discussions together. And they were really worrying, worried about the velocity, why, why it's like this. It didn't come from me, it came from them. We found that in a lot of cases with the senior developers getting them to split out the cards into smaller ones and help them actually better define the problem. Yeah. So that they could help the junior developers and it actually helped their own understanding of the problem that we were trying to solve. Yeah, exactly. All right, cool. Anything else? Yeah. You said that the change was uh, made on the team, basically. How many people did not survive the change in terms of how many people affected because of the change? We are all here. Yeah. <laughs> we didn't lose anyone, and just uh, the guy that decided to move on uh, just you know, for personal reasons. Uh, it wasn't nothing really related to the team. Uh, so yeah, we have all them here, they are over there, if you want to talk to them later, let's have <laughs> Yeah, okay.
Cool. Thank All right. You. Thank you so much.